Hey folks, it's Eli again. Uh, so as promised, I'm just uh, doing a quick recording for the recap of session one of my new Airlith campaign. Um, if, uh, I mumble that name. Uh, the name is Airlith. So um, it's uh, kind of Anglo-Saxon sounding type of a, of a setting. Anyway, so uh, this Monday I got to run the first session of the new 15, uh, the new 15 millimeter, too much miniatures gaming, but uh, the new fifth edition a campaign that I started um, for for my, my, my regular gaming group. Uh, only two of my players showed up. Um, so we had um, uh, Rumas, the human fighter uh, from the far-off land of Bukhara, which is up to the northwest. Uh, and we had uh, Alwyn, uh, the wood elf cleric, um, hailing from the amber wood. Um, so, uh, because I have a first-time player in the game and we're doing first level and it's a new system, I did want to venture too far from uh, from base on uh, on uh, this particular uh, this particular adventure, uh, starting adventure. So, I asked the players how they wanted to start. Did they want to have their characters know each other, or you know, did they want to um, do the in-game meeting? Um, they decided that they wanted to do the in-game meeting, um, so I started them in an inn, uh, the Inn of the Laughing Giant. Uh, this is an inn I've used in a, in a previous campaign, but I have it all fleshed out and detailed, and so I didn't I, I didn't really get to maximize its use in the in the last game uh, I ran, so I decided to pull it out again for this one. Um, so. The adventure I was running is a homebrew adventure uh, that I titled the uh, Val Morgan's Ledger, uh, and so it begins with the characters in the inn. They're enjoying the company of you know fellow folks of the town of Barley, uh, which is where the inn is is is, is uh, set. Um, and there's a ruckus outside, and uh, it sounds like somebody is frantically trying to gain entrance to the inn. Uh, his way is being barred by folks outside, um, and and. You know, reasonably so. It sounds like he's kind of frantic. Um, so the uh, the so uh, Rumas, uh, which is uh, my friend Derek's character, um, he's the uh, the senior player in this in this game so far. I mean, he's he's been playing since he was a kid, just like myself. Um, he decides that he's going to investigate, and uh, uh, Alwyn, um the uh, the, the elf uh, decides to follow follow along with him, and so um, and at this point, uh, Craig, who's playing the elf, uh, the elf uh, cleric, uh, uh, he's uh, he, this is his first time playing D anD. d So he's just kind of he's kind of sitting back and observing and, and taking cues from Derek, um, which is reasonable, and I completely expected that. So there's absolutely no nothing wrong there. Uh, so they go out to investigate, and they find uh, this. Uh, uh, Man in stately robes, not ostentatious, uh, long, uh, gray hair, um, kind of, uh, you know, he's he's drenched from the from the elements, and um, and uh, he's got some bruising. Uh, this is Val Morgan. Val Morgan is um, he's a uh, they don't know this yet, but you know, uh, Val Morgan is um, basically a records keeper for the vassalry of, of Erleth. And so he's frantic, and he's going on about how he, you know, his his procession, his group that were traveling uh, to Vassal City, uh, were ambushed by the Red Hand, and it's uh, been established in that the Red Hand in in the setting are a, uh, a brotherhood of bandits um, who uh, consider themselves the uh, kind of the heirs to the fear and the terror and the power of the uh, former Red King. Uh, it's sort of a, of a bullshit play on their part uh, because really, I mean, they're just thugs, um, but they've, they've used that to build up their, their, uh, their lore and their, their fear factor. Um, so Val Morgan's carrying on about how they took his servants and they took his page boy and they took all of his supplies and his ponies, uh, but most importantly, he's just ranting on about how they took his ledger. And so the players are kind of perplexed. You know, what you know, the, you know the I mean, it's a book, and out of all of the things that are missing, the you know Val Morgan seems to be most worried about the ledger. So 
uh, there's some some exchange where they ask questions and Val Morgan is very very scattered he he rattles off into this list of things and and uh, how where he was going and 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 how he was getting there and just kind of and then gets back to point he's, he's very scattered and, and, and worried at this point um, so um, as they're uh, you know basically after they find out what it is that that's going on the, there's a call out, and I believe it was Ramos, uh, you know, the human fighter, who decided to uh, make the call out to see if there's anybody who would help pursue the Red Hand. And um, uh, the once the Red Hand was announced, um, it seemed to take the, you know a lot of the cons shift a lot of the concern from Val Morgan on to uh, things more personal, more close to home. The the inn started to clear out, and the uh, the various villagers and and other patrons who were local at least started to exit out and hurry off to to their homes um, supposedly or uh, you know worried about their their own kin and kith uh, and with the with the red hand about uh, uh, Derek the player and his character Rumas were a little nonplussed by the 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 lack of enthusiasm for the, uh, the inn patrons to assist uh, Val Morgan. Uh, he's an agent of the state. Um, he was in, he's, he's been brutalized. But Rumas is also a very honorable character so far. Uh, even ahead of time, just from the get-go, he's got some sort of uh, personal code. Um, he carries two swords. One is edged and one is blunt. Uh, he calls it uh, the Lesson Giver, I believe is the name that, he, that uh, Derek gave it. It's a blunted scimitar uh, that we decided that he can, it strikes only for subdual damage. Um, uh, I suppose you could beat somebody with it, but it's not going to have a lot of weight behind it. It is just a scimitar. Um, so Ramas is a little bothered. Um, Alwyn, of course, being the other PC in the, in the, in the group, volunteers to accompany him to lend his bow. And... Um, and they are still looking. Rumas is still bothered at this point that the the, the only person to speak up is this other out, this other you know outsider, uh, this this wood elf cleric, um, it's dressed in chainmail and um, you know it's kind of uh, as much an outsider as Rumas himself. Rumas is from you know a couple of mountain ranges and a far in a, in a white desert away. He's you know still new to Erlith. Uh, he doesn't even speak. Uh, he doesn't even speak Thranic, which is the uh, the local tongue. He only communicates with the other people in the area in common, unless you know he, unless they can speak another language that he does. Uh, so he entreats the innkeeper. He asks the innkeeper, "Is there anybody else you know who who you know who can lend a hand?" And at this point, it's also Derek as a player trying to get some extra firepower because reasonably so. I mean. I've got two players at the table at this point, and I'm asking them to go after a, a bunch of cutthroats. Uh, and supposedly these cutthroats are heading southward uh, to uh, an, an old fortress on the coast called White Crag, uh, White Crag Fortress. Uh, and there's no way that, that, that they want to try and take that on by themselves. So rightfully, you know, the player and the character are seeking assistance. And the innkeeper looks around and there's not many people left in the inn and those folks who are don't seem very interested. So he volunteers his oldest son, uh, Doric. Uh, and so Doric, being the good son that he is, you know, he's just, just the other side of 18. He volunteers his axe and, and really sets out, you know, sets, you know, comes to uh, to Ramas's side and uh, with nothing more really than his kitchen apron uh, and his his work shoes. Uh, at that point, there's an old grizzled vet in the corner uh, who announces himself as Cole de Barl. And Cole de Barl, uh, actually another NPC from another campaign I ran, uh, is just a grizzled, bombastic, boastful mercenary. Uh, he's well into his 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 uh, his winter years, he's but he's still kicking. He wears old battered studded leather. Spends most of his time drinking, spending a fortune that he accumulated at some point, assuming 
um, but he, he's he's willing to go along. And so uh, they they this group you know now assembled this group of four you know two PCs and two NPCs. One of them being you know a zero level uh, innkeeper's son, and the other one you know unknown ability because uh, the players have just, the characters have just met him. Uh, at that point, I, I did a, I, I checked uh, passive perception, and Alwyn uh, notices a figure dart out from behind the stables, uh, running off in the direction of supposedly where the bandits had come from. Uh, uh, the the group of the party of four uh, pursue, and in the chase, um, Colabarl uh, is having hard hard time keeping up. And uh, Doric stays behind to, to kind of help the old man. Uh, Rumas and Alwyn uh, catch up and confront. Uh, they're running after this 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 figure. Uh, as they grow closer, uh, they can tell that he is armed and armored, uh, and he's running. Uh, he's got a hand axe at his at his hip, and he's just running full tilt across the fields. Uh, and he trips and falls, and at that point they gain some ground on him. And as he's getting up, uh, Ramas uh, call, you know, and uh, calls out to him and starts, you know, trying to, you know, get him to stand down, making sure that he's not going to attack. Meanwhile, Alwyn's got his short bow trained on, on this man, so he's really not inclined uh, to make any sudden moves. Um, and so we're going to start this interplay with Ramas uh, trying to. Uh, talk the man down, uh, trying to get some information maybe, um, and uh, did a couple of checks. And as as things went on, uh, the the relations break down, and so I have them roll initiative. Uh, basically, at uh, basically the uh, the red hand bandit that they they've caught up to, he drops his hand, starts going for his axe. Um, at which point, Alwyn fires off his, 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 his fires off an arrow and puts it right through the guy's uh, sword arm. Puts it right through his his, his forearm. Uh, so the the band is now checked. At that point, Rumas moves forward, and um, there's some more altercation. They get some information as to where um, you know basically where the the fortress is, and they decide rather than pursue late in the evening uh, they're going to take this bandit um, back to back to Barley and uh, uh, put him in the custody of the sheriff so they go into Barley uh, they, they go to the sheriff the sheriff is rather casual about it when they get there um, he kind of turns his back on the on, on Ramos and Arwen or Alwyn excuse me um, as they're talking to him and, and really just you know waves his hand off and says just put him in the cell and uh, as they're doing this he turns his back and goes over to I describe it he goes over and he opens up a cabinet and starts going through it uh, and so um, as, the, as this is happening you know they're they're putting the, uh, the the bandit in the cell and they turn around and uh, the sheriff's like all right so how do you want your bounty and they're like bounty so yeah, there's a t there's a ten gold piece per head bounty on members of the Red Hand. Uh, you know they're blackguards, they're 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 ruffians. They're you know they terrorize the countryside. Uh, so uh, they take their money, um, and Ramas insists that everybody who pursued this man gets a fair share. So he takes his share, and Alwyn gets his share, and then they head back to Barley to the inn, uh, uh, presumably to go ahead and get make sure that. Doric, the innkeeper's son, and Cole uh, get their uh, their their share of the of the treasure. Well, um, uh, Doric, being the honest, good kid that he is, has a hard time accepting it, but grudgingly takes the money. Um, you know, even though he really didn't do much, he had to help. He had to stop to help Cole, and uh, he guarantees the, the 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 characters that you know the party that he'll make sure that Cole gets his. Uh, so the next morning comes around, uh, they wake up, uh, they're having breakfast, you know, I mean, typical inn stuff, I don't, you know, we can, you know, I could lay it out. So the next day comes and they make sure that uh, Cole gets his, uh, make sure that Cole got his money, 
uh, you know, and uh, you know, Doric is not willing to make the trip so far from home. Cole is still smarting from uh, the pursuit. His old bones just can't take it. And so uh, Alwyn and, uh, and Ramas head off uh, in the direction of the southwest towards, uh, the, is towards White, uh, White Crag Fortress. Um, as they're traveling, they decide that the bandits are, are in, you know, Ramos decides that he, he feels that they can, they can actually intercept the bandits, uh, intercept the Red Hand before they get to the fortress. Uh, the Red Hand are encumbered, they've got ponies, they've got treasure, they've got prisoners, uh, they're, and they're traveling, they're not going to be traveling by road, they're going to be going overland, so their, their pace is going to be, uh, to be slowed down. It's three days from Barley to, three days travel by foot from Barley uh, to, uh, uh, to the coast where, where White Crag is, and so Ramos decides, Ramos and then Alwyn, they both talk, and Ramos decides that they should take the roads slightly off course and head down towards uh, Coulter's Cove, which is a coastal town, uh, coastal, a coastal city, actually. And, uh, and then they can go by road, make up some time, and then cut across uh, the last bit of, of distance between Coulter's Cove and head north to um, White Crag. So there's a, a bit of a travel, you know, down tour, you know, travel that uh, goes pretty uneventful uh, to uh, Coulter's Cove. Uh, as they approach, I describe how it's kind of the, they down as the, the, the high plains that are the fertile uh, plains of the Kingdom of Caleth, where, um, where Barley is, and rolls down uh, to kind of a rocky coast in this bowl uh, where uh, Coulter's Cove is. And as they, just, they see kind of dark buildings, dark wood buildings, uh, kind of you know, sea soaked and, and old, uh, and columns of black smoke and, smoke and kind of an acrid smell in the air. And then as they look around, they see all these large boats and, and ships in the harbor. And, and then Alwyn is horrified. His wood elf senses, sense of, sensibilities of, of nature and respect are horrified as he looks to a small inlet off to the side of Coulter's Cove and realizes that it is red with bl with the blood of all the whales uh, that uh, Coulter's Cove uh, has 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 processed and slaughtered, and then he realizes that the columns of smoke and the smell are all whale oil being processed, and uh, uh, he's disgusted. And at this point, Ramos is not overly thrilled uh, at all, as far as I could tell either. Uh, they decide not to go into Coulter's Cove, even though it is a city, and technically the players could have had a chance to maybe you know, pick up some, some plot, some supplies here. Um, they decide to press forward, you know, press on and head north, uh, towards White Crag. Um, so as they've been traveling, I've been doing some checks in the background, kind of just making sure, you know, you have random encounter checks. They've been lucking out at this point. Um, so at night, as night comes on, they, and they're still traveling, they're, they're trying to make up time. They're trying to guarantee that they, that they can intercept, uh, the Red Hand before they get to the fortress. Ramas and Alwyn definitely, you know, there's just the two of them. Uh, they do not want to, to, to have to try and go into the fortress to try and recover Val Morgan's ledger. Um, and so as they're approaching, as they're heading toward, heading north in the darkness, um, reaching some, they're kind of going over that rolling rocky terrain that I described down by Coulter's Cove. And they see a campfire up ahead. So it gets a little fun at this point. So they, just, they see this campfire, uh, they, they move a little closer, they're still at range, and as they, grow, as they grow closer to the campfire, they make out about six men, you know, around the fire, give or take. It's kind of hard to tell. Uh, and so they decide that they're going to try and approach uh, at, on different flanks the camp and, and try to surprise the bandits trying to get the jump on them. Uh, Ramas is trying to get closer initially so he can see if he can hear what they're talking about, try and get some, gain some intelligence from them. And Alwyn is trying to cover that approach with his short bow uh, in hand, with his bow. And so as they're moving closer, and once they get close enough to where I feel it matters, uh, I start having them make stealth checks. 
Uh, Ramos makes his stealth check no problem. He's sneaky. He's lightly armored. Um, you know, and uh, you know he he manages to blend in the terrain. Alwyn's wearing chainmail. So in fifth edition you ruled by fifth edition rules, he's got disadvantage for making stealth checks, and so he rolls poorly, uh, just really badly. So he fails a stealth check. Uh, you know his his chainmail rattles, and um, the 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 red hand that are camped out, uh, they get they they hear him, then they, they kind of perk up and they kind of call out to the dark. Um, and when they get no response, and they kind of go back to their business, I'm playing them as kind of figuring they've they've pulled one over and so at this point they're not at that that first failed stealth check they're not on guard uh, so they try to draw closer Alwyn's trying to get closer so he's in a good he's in short range for uh, his bow um, he's already disadvantage he's you know, he, he doesn't have disadvantage because of the, the the darkness he's an elf he's got he's you know he's, he's got dark vision um, so he tries to go closer. He fails a second stealth check. At this point, the 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 bandits are a little bit more alert. Now, while Alwyn's been moving forward and failing, um, Ramas has been moving closer as well. Ramas's primary missile attack is are, 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 are uh, darts. Basically, uh, uh, Derek has decided that uh, Ramas has a bandolier of throwing irons, these little throwing daggers, uh, and so. He's got to get closer to be able to engage at, at range, but that's fine. So he's stealthy and he's moving up. Uh, so they're calling, the bandits are calling out into the darkness and Alwyn is trying to uh, stay quiet. The bandits don't see him yet because while they can hear him, it's not, they don't have visual on him. And so uh, Alwyn decides to, he's got, he's, he's really wanting to get, he's really wanting to close range. You know, Craig really wants to get his character into range for that short bow so he's not at long range. Um, and so he moves closer. I mean, he's, he doesn't want to be at a disadvantage uh, for that long range shot. So he tries to move closer and he fails a third stealth check. At this point, the bandits are fully convinced that there's somebody out there. They're crying out into the darkness. They're yelling. Uh, and uh, the, the crossbowmen among them start firing into the dark. So they're firing. They're at disadvantage. They're, the, because they're shooting into the dark and they can't see the target, they're at, they're, they, they are also disadvantaged. And so... This exchange goes on where um, the, I mean, the combat begins and Alwyn's firing and, and the, the bandits are firing back and forth and, um, you know, at the, you know, and then Ramas starts throwing his throwing irons now. He's hitting. I mean, he's close enough. He's hitting. Uh, he's got a good beat on the bandits. He takes one down, uh, wounds another. Uh, Alwyn manages to get a couple of arrows in. Uh, but overall, throughout the exchange, um, you know, Alwyn manages to... to fire off like eight arrows and only hits with two of them uh and it's getting pretty ridiculous so at that point uh he you know he drops his bow and um and uh he uh no actually excuse me pardon me he he he, he fumbled with his bow and and, and determined i rolled and determined he broke his bow his bowstring broke and so he, he he pulls out his his uh his warhammer at that point and uh and charges forward you know this is he's got chain mail on he's got a shield so he drops his bow pulls the shield off his back and pulls out his warhammer and charges in at which point ramas springs from his hiding point uh and and engages the bandits in melee uh the battle goes pretty pretty lopsided pretty one said the bandits are already heavily reduced uh in numbers and and what's left of them are already are already wounded uh and so ramas and alwyn dispatch the bandits pretty easily uh, at this point, we're running low on time, and so we decided to call it for the night with some last remarks. Um, Ramos and Alwyn uh, stabilize the bandits that they could. Uh, one of them did die, uh, but Ramos, um, still trying to figure out exactly the specifics of Derek's uh, character's uh, code of conduct, but Ramos has some sort of hesitation at least even if not a code against but a hesitation on just outright killing people um i think it had if, if i recall correctly it's, it's something to about giving them a chance before he he kills them so basically giving them a chance to yield um so at this point they've got uh, uh five of the six bandits uh tied up uh three of them i believe are still conscious enough to to talk and uh, that's where we left off for the night. Uh, 
all in all, I think the first session uh, for the game went really well. I mean, I was down one player. It's going to be a small game anyways. Three players is manageable. It's just shy of the four that they really talk about as the minimum you want to play 5th uh, edition with for actually you know a party. And Derek is an experienced player, so he kind of makes up for some of the some of what might be lacking there. Uh, I think Craig did really well for his first time ever with a tabletop RPG. Uh, he was a little hesitant and a little lost at times, but that's pretty normal when you're first starting out. Uh, Derek um, is the kind of player as a DM that you kind of get to keep an eye out on. Because not because he's going to cheat or anything, he's he gets everything. Nothing escapes Derek. He's he's a note taker. He's sitting there with his laptop typing out notes as we play, and that doesn't detract from his ability to play. I mean, Derek's not only is he playing in character, but he's in voice most of the time. Um, but yeah, I think it really went really well. Both characters, um, you know, within the the scope of the players playing them, seem to already have an established character. You know, like personality and character. Um, Craig and I talked a little bit after the game, and actually um, today um, we we, we kind of kind of touched bases with him at work uh, about you know uh, how he very much forgot about, and this is understandable, and it's his first time out. I mean, forgot about uh, the cleric aspect of his character. I mean, he did bang he did a bang up job being fire support, which is a cleric's other ability, but. Uh, yeah, he, uh, he so he's gonna he's definitely gonna have to step up and you know figure out what his cleric can do because that's a lot. There's a lot that we figured out he could have done in that fight. Um, he's he's got a war domain cleric, which means he's got some pretty impressive uh, early level abilities through his his domain spells, um, and he forgot to prepare spells, um, and uh, and uh, so that was that was that was hampering. I mean, they didn't need them. Nobody took a lot of damage. Um, every uh, every opponent that they were fighting, which was really just the six bandits, um, rolled horribly. I believe Alwyn was grazed with an arrow, and that's that uh, a crossbow bolt. And I think that was about it. Um, so um, one of, one kind of fun scene is uh, one of the bandits took a swing at, at Ramos with his crossbow after the crossbow uh, had broke its mechanism. Uh, cr uh, the bandit fumbled. Um, and then Ramos summarily cut him down. Um, but yeah, so, um, next week I'm expecting to have all three of my players there. Um, and that means we will have, uh, my brother, uh, there and his, his bard. Uh, and, uh, got to figure out how I'm going to bring them together seeing as the, the, the adventures already started, but it's a pretty simple, uh, dovetail. I, I'm, you know, probably going to go with something, uh, with, uh, you know, maybe, uh, the bard is is also tracking the red hand through some other lead, uh, but yeah, and uh, so uh, hopefully next week uh, we'll be able to move on with the rest of the adventure and see at least get into the the nuts and bolts of it. This one went kind of off rails, and I kind of expected it to because of the uh, the two players. Um, they might have played it a little bit more cautious. I was ready for that already. I, I kind of expected that they would not just charge headlong towards White Crag. Um, and so everything that happened in the adventure after Val Morgan showing up was was all improv stuff because really, uh, you know, they didn't they didn't get to White Crag yet. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, but yeah. Uh, so thanks for. Uh, tuning in to this first of what I hope will be several adventure recaps and uh, um, certainly appreciate if you're tuning in and starting to check out my, um, my little YouTube channel here. I appreciate it. Uh, remember to uh, comment, ask questions. Um, if you're wondering about something that went on or how I handled something or have questions in general about gaming or on the, any of the other videos, um, by all means, uh, leave the questions in the comments. I will go ahead and answer them. Uh, if you have friends and, and fellow gamers who might be interested, spread the word. Uh, you know, give me a share, and uh, that'll certainly be appreciated as well. Um, so that is Elf Bait for today, and uh, uh, one of these days I'll probably do a video on where that that name comes from. But until then, uh, this is Eli, and have a good night. Bye.